Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, today we are going to learn in this class about some more interesting bacteria. They are interesting not only because they have some different properties as compared to bacteria, but still they belong to the group of bacteria. Best way to study them is by taking the examples of the cases we have encountered in the past. So, let us begin this class by taking few examples. This was a boy about 14 year old who came with high fever, headache, myalgia, severe arthralgia and very typical rash. This boy also gave the history that he was playing around in a marshy area and vaguely remembers that he might have been bitten by few insects which he really cannot recollect the morphology and other details. There was another case again a child of 12 year old, this was a girl. She also came with similar complaints of high fever, severe myalgia, headache and a typical rash. When taken history, the parents of the child told that she is infested by louse on her head and also few on her body. This was the case history which we got and when the case was examined, we found that the child was febrile with hypotension. She had very typical rash which on history that it began with the maculopapular turned erythematous and turned into the petechial type of rash. The rash started appearing initially on the wrist and ankles and it moved towards the trunk that is this particular rash is centripetal in distribution. Other findings which were noted in this case was the child was little altered mental sensorium and also she was found to have hyponatremia, low platelet counts and the prolonged clotting time. Now what we need to consider is these two cases have come to us as the pyrexia of unknown origin because we could not trace the etiology by routine investigations. In such cases with the appearance of typical rash high fever and a history of insect bites or the infestations. It is important to consider the following differential diagnosis like it could be just a common typhoid fever or sometimes in Indian scenario we may not be able to notice the appearance of rash or even the patients might not have noticed such things. In such cases it typically mimics a case of meningitis, we need to keep it in mind. Other fevers we can expect though not very common. However, few cases have been reported in India. It is important to keep in mind the spotted fever groups and the typhus fevers. Other than that leptospirosis, meningococcal sepsis, malaria, plague and Lyme disease also need to be kept in mind. So, these were the differential diagnosis in uh, these cases and also it is important to recollect and understand that what are some diseases which are transmitted by the vectors and with the typical history in, in two children we have considered here. Let us see what are the diseases which are transmitted by the tick bite, mite bite and the louse infestation. The diseases transmitted by the tick are the rocky mounted spotted fever, Lyme's disease, tularemia, babesiosis, ehrlichiosis and others. The diseases which are transmitted by the mite are the scrub typhus, rickett shell pox. Similarly, the diseases which are transmitted by the louse are epidemic typhus. So, these are some of the diseases which also we kept in mind before we went on to the final clinical diagnosis. However, the support of laboratory and a detailed microbiologic workup is very important in such cases. Let us look into what was 
tentative clinical diagnosis in case number 1. Because this patient came with high fever, myalgia, typical rash with the supportive findings, we thought that this case going more towards the diagnosis of scrub typhus. Because the child also was playing on the river side in a marshy area in scrubs with the history of insect bites. In the case 2, again the child came with the similar symptoms. She also had a typical rash here with the supportive findings. We considered the diagnosis of epidemic typhus. As I said earlier, in some of the cases we may miss rash especially when patients who have dark colored skin, the rash typically may not get noticed in such cases. However, it is very important to examine detail and also take the detailed history because rash is one typical clinical sign. We may miss the diagnosis which may go into complications. If there is presence of rash, the appearance and the spread of rash whether it is centripetal, centrifugal or whether the involvement of palm and soles were present or not. Here in case 2, the child did not have any rash on the palm and soles that is one of the diagnostic sign in epidemic typhus usually the palm and soles are spared. As I said it is important to go for supportive lab diagnosis a detailed microbiological workup is important for confirming the clinical diagnosis as well as initiating specific therapy because sometimes these diseases may get into complications and could be turning fatal. In these two cases, we collected the blood as well as biopsy from the rash. However, in case number 1, the boy had scab, the material from there was collected and from case number 2, tissue biopsy from rash was collected and sent to the laboratory. Here, the diagnosis also depends upon how well we collect the sample and typical stains have to be used in such cases like the Jimsa stain, Jimenez stains and others which we will consider a little later. Gram stain is usually not done in such cases, special staining is preferred. We also went into the serological test as the culture is usually restricted to only specialized laboratories. The serological test like Weil Felix test and the indirect immunofluorescence test both turn to be positive in these cases. By these findings, we could confirm the diagnosis of scrub typhus in case number 1 and epidemic typhus in case 2. Similarly, the report was sent to the physician immediately the treatment from empirical therapy was changed towards the specific therapy. They were treated by doxycycline for about 10 days or more and both the children recovered. We saved them from following complications. This brings us to the lesson objectives of today's class. We have discussed a case and diagnosed it as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. At the end of this class, we are able to learn what are the other infections caused by rickettsial organisms, the organism characteristics and the lab diagnosis of such diseases. We are going to discuss the topic under following headings. We will learn about the details of disease spectrum etiology, clinical presentation and also the treatment of some important rickettsial group of diseases. We are also going to learn about the organism characteristics, their general characteristic, cultural characteristics, pathogenesis etc. and learn about the laboratory diagnosis in detail. Let us begin with what are the rickettsial infections. Rickettsial fevers are very important because they can have high fatality rate and can present as medical emergencies. The fatality rate ranges somewhere from 1 to 3 percent up to 25 percent when the disease is left untreated. They are very common in the western world though not commonly seen in India. Some of the diseases are also seen in uh, the parts of Kashmir. So, it is important to remember and consider them as one of the differential diagnosis when we are in a dilemma to diagnose some of the pyrexia of unknown origin cases. The disease most commonly come across in the months between April to September because it is related to the, the feeding habits of adult ticks that is the time when they are active. Rickettsial group of diseases are transmitted by the vectors. 
arthropod vectors and ticks, louse, mite and the flea. Usually the disease distribution depends upon the type of distribution of these vectors the, those are the areas which are common. These are some of the important rickettsial infections and the vector pathogen which is causing such infections. The vector like tick, dog tick or the wood tick is known to transmit the disease rocky mountain spotted fever and causative organism is rickettsia rickettsiae. Similarly, the rodents are reservoirs of rickettsia acari which causes rickettsial pox and it is transmitted by the mite. Epidemic typhus is transmitted by the body louse. The disease is common all over the world. Causative agent is rickettsia proboscis. Humans are the reservoirs of infection. Endemic or murine typhus is caused by rickettsia typhi. Rat flea which is the vector. Let us understand some organism characteristics. These organisms are a group of pleomorphic minute cocobacillary forms. They are non-capsulated and non-motile. They were initially considered and thought as the viruses because they were intracellular. They needed some live cells to grow and multiply. However, they were put back and considered in the group of bacteria because they had both DNA and RNA and because of other resemblances to bacteria, they are now considered as one of the smallest existing bacteria. They are obligate intracellular parasites and they are also called as energy stealing parasites basically because they lack genes for glucose metabolism, lipid metabolism and also nucleic acid synthesis. These organisms have got peculiar tropism for vascular endothelial cell. This is the reason that we see typical rash. They need arthropod vectors for transmission except Q fever. This is the reason that the coxiella group of organisms have been not considered usually as a group of rickettsiae. Let us look into some of the staining properties. Usually we will not see them under light microscope when stained by gram stain. However, we can see them when we stain using Jimsa stain, Jimenez stain, Castaneda and Machiavello stains. By the Jimsa or Castaneda stain, they stain bluish purple whereas they stain deep red by Machiavello and Jimenez stains. Let us look into the cultural properties. As I said, they do not grow outside the cells. They are obligate intracellular parasites. They are however cultivated on yolk sac of chikamirio. We can also use guinea pigs and mice. These are also used as the diagnostic test to demonstrate positive tunica reaction or neil Moser's reaction. We can also grow them on the cell lines, mouse fibroblast cell lines, HeLa cell line, HEP2 cell line and others. Let us now look into how are rickettsiae classified clinically depending upon the type of fevers they produce. For example, spotted fever group, typhus group and the scrub typhus. Spotted fever group have got majority of the species, the diseases which are included in the typhus group are endemic typhus, epidemic typhus and recrudescent typhus. We will discuss a little bit more about these diseases in this class. This is the organism classifications based on their genes or the species. The rickettsia family is further divided into rickettsia, orientia, coxiella and ehrlichia. As I said, some of the researchers do not consider coxiella into this family because they do not require the vector for transmission and some other. The rickettsia group includes 17 species as I said, but most of the medically important ones which can cause spotted fever are rickettsia rickettsiae, rickettsia conori, australis, siberica and acari. And the rickettsia which cause typhus fever are rickettsia proboscis and rickettsia typhi. The next group is orientia, 
single species here which is medically important is Orientia susuga mushi which causes scrub typhus. The Ehrlichia group includes Ehrlichia some of the important species. In, let us look into the pathogenesis. Usually these organisms exist in a reservoir and accidentally they are transmitted to the human host. The mode of infection is usually by the vector bite but sometimes it can be through inhalation of the dried feces vectors or from the reservoirs or very rarely laboratory workers can also get infection or sometimes it could be through the oral route as well. It is said that once a tick or mite is feeding on a person, 6 hours of contact is required because once it ingests the organisms, organisms are supposed to be multiplying in the hot blood which is ingested by the vector for about 6 hours active multiplication of the organisms takes place in the vector and then they are transmitted to the host. So, the contact hour usually required is about 6 hours. Sometimes the mode of infection is through crushing of the feces on minor aberrations produced by the bite of these vectors. So, once the organisms enter into the skin, they get into circulation have got special predilection or the receptors on the vascular endothelial surface and they are phagocytosed immediately. Once they are into the phagosome, they release phospholipase, there is going to be lysis of phagolysosome, the organisms escape into the cytoplasm, they multiply. Once they have escaped, they go and bind to the actin filaments which will help them through the cell membrane to the next cell. This is how they damage endothelial cells, they get into the next cell. This ultimately results into damage which further results into fluid loss, hypovolemia, hyponatremia and a series of events which is going to initiate the circulatory failure and DIC. And this is the main reason that we see a lot of case fatalities when the disease remains untreated. This is the whole of pathogenesis. Now let us look into the clinical features. The disease typically presents as high fever, severe headache, myalgia and arthralgias. There can be sometimes associated vomiting, diarrhea, periorbital swelling and also typical neck stiffness is present. With the three features of fever, neck stiffness and vomiting, sometimes this disease is wrongly diagnosed as meningitis. The rash is very typical, it is maculopapular to start with and later it may go into petechial rash. Usually the rash appears on the third or fourth day of fever. History in case of such cases is very important because we need to take the progression of rash is very typical. In the sense it starts on wrists and ankles, it spreads especially in case of spotted fever group. The rash does not spare the palm and soles and it typically spreads centripetally. It goes towards the center of the body, the rash appears on the trunk and that is how the typical progression takes place. On the other hand, in typhus group, the rash goes centripetally but it, it usually spares palm and soles. This is the important difference between the potted fever group and typhus fevers. In severe cases, patient might approach the doctor who may be already in state of DIC or circulatory failure. Let us look into a little bit details about typhus group of fevers, three types of typhus fevers, epidemic typhus, endemic typhus and recrudescent typhus that is also called as a Brill-Zinsser's disease. The epidemic typhus which is present world over, it is transmitted by the louse borne typhus. The epidemic typhus is called as a louse borne typhus and it is transmitted by the body louse. The disease is more common in the overcrowded. It is mostly seen after war and famines and also in the prisons etcetera. It is caused by Rickettsia provisaki. 
mostly the disease is in the western world. The incubation period is 5 to 15 days, rash is present, it is going to start on the extremities, ankles and the wrist joints usually. It does not go on to the palm and soles, it spares them and it spreads centripetally. The case fatality is even higher in typhus group, it may go as high as up to 40 percent. In case of endemic typhus, transmitting vector here is flea. The organism causing is rickettsia typhi or the rickettsia museri. The disease here is much milder when we compare it to the epidemic typhus. The mode of infection here is either by inhalation of the dried feces or by ingestion of the food contaminated by the rat feces or rat urine. So, just now we have discussed in detail clinical features and the distribution of the spotted fever group, epidemic typhus, endemic typhus which are usually the commoner diseases. Now, among these rickettsial infections, what are some of those which are seen in India? Sometimes we may miss them while we are diagnosing a case of pyrexia of unknown origin. It is important to keep these diseases in mind. One of them is the scrub typhus. Recently, there was an outbreak in a rural area close to Pune, where a group of children were infected by the scrub typhus. The scrub typhus typically is acquired by the children playing in the riverside or in the marshy areas where there are lot of shrubs. The children will be usually bitten by larvae of mites which are called as the chiggers. Hence, this disease is called as a chigger born typhus. This is caused by Orentia susugamushi. This is transmitted by Leptotrombidium deliniensis. The disease is sometimes found in some parts of rural India. It can also be found in other Asian countries. It is also common in those areas where there are moist and marshy areas with lot of scrub vegetations. It is important that nowadays to keep these diseases in mind when we are investigating pyrexia of unknown origin. So, after having covered the disease spectrum in detail, the characteristics of the organisms, let us now go into understanding the laboratory diagnosis in these fevers. Different modalities of laboratory diagnosis are like the microscopy, culture, serological techniques and also the molecular techniques. We collect the blood sample and also the tissue from the rash. The best sample would be tissue biopsy from the rash. Once we collect the material, we are going to crush the material, make it into smear or we can use it for the culture. The tissue is subjected to one of these staining, Jimsa stain, Jimenez stain or the fluorescent labeled antibody staining and if it is a tissue then we can go for immunohistochemistry stainings. Immunohistochemistry and the fluorescent labeled antibody stains are highly specific. Here we can see intracellular organisms which are stained bluish purple and this is after the Jimsa stain. These organisms were initially thought that they are viruses because of their minute size you can see they are typically pleomorphic in nature. Coming to the culture, we should not attempt culturing these organisms, they are highly infectious agents. The samples again, we are going to use the same blood and biopsy material. We can grow them in the yolk sac of the chick embryo and we can also go for either guinea pig or mouse to demonstrate a typical test here. This is called as the Neil Moser's reaction. What is it? The Neil Moser's reaction is reaction which occurs when we inject crushed material mixed with the skimmed milk or the brain heart infusion broth and injected intraperitoneally into the mouse or the guinea pig. At the end of 3 days, there is development of typical fever and scrotal swelling, which is very important. Because of scrotal swelling, we will not be able to push the testis into the abdomen because of the adhesions which are going to be formed due to the inflammation of layers of testis. 
this is called as a positive neil moser's reaction or the tunica reaction especially the tunica reaction is positive and also the animal will die in case if it is rocky mountain spotted fever and in some other spotted fevers there is only development of fever and positive reaction however the animal does not die epidemic typhus fever is present no tunica reaction so this is a milder reaction in epidemic typhus group looking into the positive test and also the reaction of the animal here we can give the diagnosis accordingly so the neil moser's reaction is a very typical test we which we use to differentiate different types of fevers depending on the reaction we can also use the embryonated egg tissue cultures and shell viral cultures to grow these organisms now let us look into what are some of the serological tests which are available for diagnosis here we can either go in for antigen detection or antibody detection some of the antigen detection tests are the immunofluorescence test and if it is the the tissue which is already fixed we can go for immunohistochemistry tests they are all done on the tissue biopsies these tests are rapid and highly sensitive and specific test we can also use pcr or elisa for detecting the rickettsial antigen there are some tests which help us to detect the specific antibodies the antibody tests are complement fixation test we can also go in for antibody detection elisas wheel felix test and the western blot test what is most important among all of them is the wheel felix test this test is a very easy test because we have some antigens which are present on the rickettsia which are shared by proteus group of organisms the proteus group of organisms can be used to detect presence of antibodies this is a basis of wheels felix test so especially the proteus mirabilis and proteus vulgaris the antigens are ox2 oxk ox19 in case of scrub type typhus for example oxk test is positive by wheel felix test in this table we can see that in rocky mountain spotted fever ox19 and ox2 are positive similarly rickettsial pox none of the antibodies are positive however in epidemic typhus ox19 and also in endemic typhus ox19 positive this is the usefulness of wheel felix test it is easy it is specific and also a rapid test for diagnosis of rickettsial fevers we also have the molecular test for diagnosing rickettsial fevers that is the pcr we have discussed in detail about the microscopic culture methods serological tests and some of the molecular methods which are available for diagnosis of the rickettsial fevers let us now look into the treatment high index of suspicion is important and once we suspect any rickettsial fever it is important to treat them immediately because of high case fatality rates as discussed the drug of choice especially in rocky mountain fever, spotted fever as we came across in the index case in this class is doxycycline it should be given for prolonged time that is up to 10 days or even longer not only giving antibiotics is important but also supportive therapy especially if the patients have already come in the circulatory failure treating the dic and reversal of the circulatory failure status becomes very important in treating these cases how do we prevent best is to avoid the vector voids and also eliminate all the reservoirs it is suggested to improve the sanitary measures and also avoid overcrowding in this class we have learned details of the diseases we have learned the details of the organisms and also an approach to laboratory diagnosis of rickettsial infections at the same time we have covered the lesson objectives the take home points finally it is very important to timely diagnose and also to treat rickettsial infections and also very important is to recognize the rash take the detailed history of development of rash thank you very much for your attention